This verse doesn't necessarily indicate tongues. All you have to do is look at what it says, say what it says, and don't say what it doesn't say. There are a lot of people who are just in love with tongues. As a matter of fact, for some, tongues have become an idol. Some people worship tongues more than they worship the word of God. <laughs> that is sad. Now, am I saying that no one should speak in tongues? Well, I guess it depends on what the definition of the word tongues is. I won't rehash that right now. Uh, the Bible does say not to forbid it. I'm not forbidding it. I'm just simply saying do everything according to the way the word says, the way the word aligns it, the way the word spells it out. Don't do something that the Bible doesn't say. Do. And certainly don't take a text, twist the text to make it mean what it doesn't say. When we talk about praying in tongues, is there a such thing? I say, no, we don't have an example of it, a biblical example of it. Now, there are those that will say yes, and we'll go to 1 Corinthians in a little bit, but they tend to go to one particular passage that is easily a passage that they should never go to and easily debunks what they're saying. Benefit number one is you're able to engage in spirit-led prayer. When you don't know what to pray for, you can pray in tongues and the Spirit will make intercession out of you. I like to say when you pray in tongues, the Holy Spirit has a prayer reading on the inside of you. Romans 8.26 says this, In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We don't know what we should pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. So this is that prayer language where the Holy Spirit is interceding, acting our, or aligning our prayers with God's perfect will. It is absolutely amazing how people go to this particular passage and make the passage say what it clearly doesn't say. It's clear what it does say. The words, even the English, are clear. The Greek even more so, but you don't need the Greek to understand what it's saying in English. We'll look at that in a second, but I keep hearing this, and even when my in my discussion with Marcus Rogers, his first or one of his statements was focusing on something that, that he thinks Romans 8 26 is saying about tongues, and it is not. So let's think right. about this for a second. That's the Holy Spirit making intercession on your behalf. It, it can't be. See, here's why, why it can't be Romans 8 26. Let me pull it up real quick. Here's why yes, you can you can never use Romans 8 26, whether it's the Greek or the English. Notice what he says. He says, verse 26, he says, in the same way, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the, look what it says, but the Spirit himself intercedes with us, for us, with groanings too deep for words. Some some verse might say with words that cannot be uttered, but this word right here in the Greek that I have highlighted, uh, stenagmois, that means an inward sign. There's nothing coming out of the person's mouth. It's the Holy Spirit that is saying something that is, that is communicating or with these groanings that are too deep for words. There are no words that are coming out. So, so this couldn't be talking about tongues. Matter of fact, what he's speaking about in this part in, in Romans 8, he's speaking about our salvation. And so he's not speaking about, about tongues because uh, if he did, that be that would be odd that these tongues are not pronounced. There's no words coming out. They, they are uh, groanings too deep with words or stenogmoist. What, these, what, is, what does that mean again? And could you send me that? Because I've been looking for something like that to get in the Greek and the Hebrew, whatever Bible app that is. But what is it saying that that groanings means right there? St Stenogmois, it's an inward groaning. It's a it's an inward it's an inward sighing. So as I'm trying to explain to him why this can't be, and then you notice that he he is almost as though he doesn't know, never heard this, or maybe in shock, or just found something new. Uh, his statement is, well, I, I would, I, wow, I would love to see that soft with you. Have. I've been looking for something like that. And being a pastor, you ought to be able to, you should know this ahead of time. You should already have some of these tools. You should be familiar or try to familiarize yourself with the languages and how to execute the text properly. But let's go to the text. Romans 8, 26 says, in the same way. Now, what is the context of Romans 8? Let's start off with that. The context of Romans 8 is the same as Romans 7, the same as Romans 6, the same as Romans 5 and 4, even when we talk about Romans 9, 10, and 11 as it relates to it regarding Israel, it's about salvation, being saved, and God is going to fulfill ultimately saving those people um, who he deems to. He, he has put these people in him, and they will not fall away. We see that at the beginning of Romans 8, and the end of Romans 8. And then in the middle, Romans 8, 26, he says, in the same way, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses. What's the point? Well, the point is keeping us 
in Christ. The Holy Spirit is powerful. What does the Holy Spirit want to do? Work in us, causing us, as Ezekiel 36 says, and as Jeremiah 32 says, and other passages state that he will cause us to walk in him. And so, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Or some verses may say with, word, uh, with, with words with no utterance or words that could not be uttered. In other words, these are things that doesn't come out of our mouth. It says here, too deep for words. Does anyone take this? How, do you, how could you take this, that this is referring to tongues? There's just no way. Remember, these are groanings that are too deep for words. So whatever the groanings are, these pains, these stenogmois, and we'll talk about this word in a second, the Greek word, there's no, no verbalization of it. Well, so what does this word mean, stenagmois? Stenagmois literally means an inward sighing. It's silent. It doesn't come out. So this could not refer to tongues. The problem is people still want to refer to it because they're just searching for an answer, any legitimate answer as to why someone should pray in tongues. He prays perfect prayers. He knows every detail about your character, about your mind about your nature and he prays prayers that are perfected just for you and he prays with groanings meaning passion vigor and those groanings cannot be expressed in words why because they're cries of the spirit within me now Romans 8 26 here is not specifically describing the gift of tongues but it is talking about the source of that gift so here he is saying that it doesn't really mean that, but we can use it to make it mean that. And then he's not the only one. So too does Vlad Sabchuk. This verse doesn't necessarily indicate tongues. Romans chapter 8, verse 26 and 27. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray as we ought. But the Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. So this is not necessarily explicitly speaking about tongues, it's speaking about groanings. And he who searches the hearts knows the minds of the Spirit, what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. But this, this principle is here. Well, if you're going to start by saying it doesn't really indicate tongues, we'll leave it at that. Don't, don't force it. The reason why they have to force it is because they are light on passages, text, to stay so now i've been on record and it's it, it's it's a, just a fact that i've stated things in some of these men in their hearing and so their response uh would be making a video or making a statement said well yeah i can't get around what was said but let me just use it as part of what the spirit is trying to do well in this case the spirit is speaking about keeping you saved that's the point of this now they go to first corinthians chapter 14 verse 13 I say that there is no such thing as praying in a tongue. But wait a minute, Corey. We see in 1 Corinthians 14 that it does seem to say that someone is praying in a tongue. Well, let's look at the text then. Now, therefore, the one who speaks in a tongue, notice the Greek word, lalon, glosis. Every time we see speaking in tongues, whether it be the Old Testament example that is referred to or that's quoted or mentioned here in, in, in 1 Corinthians 14 back in Isaiah, it's the same as speaking in tongues. Lalo, laleo. Uh, and glossi, so it's speaking in tongues, and as we drop down, oh, I'm sorry, if we go to Acts, to Acts uh, chapter 2, as we go to Acts 10, Acts 19, the same two words are used, uh, la, 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 or in this case, la long glossi, some derivation of it, and then if you want to take the longer ending of Mark to be accurate, fine, the same two words are used there, and then even here in 1 Corinthians 12 and 1 Corinthians 14, the same two words are used, however, we get to one passage and it's a different word that's used here. Something else is happening. So in verse 14, notice what Paul says. Well, sorry, I'm sorry. Let's back up to verse 13. He says, therefore, let the one who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. So we obviously the speaking and the praying are two different words. And so he should pray. He should want to have this desire, this prayer that he may interpret you. Why? Because he wants you to understand. Where does that come from? Well, he starts off this whole portion of spiritual gifts or spiritual things. He says, now concerning the spiritual things, 
um, pneumatikon, which is the word for spiritual things. The word gifts isn't there, but fine. If you want to go to gifts, he says, I do not want you to be ignorant. And what is he speaking about? If, as we keep reading, he's speaking about people who are just saying things. They have no idea what they're saying. There are those that are actually saying Jesus be accursed. How do you have the Holy Spirit and say Jesus is accursed? The same Holy Spirit that, that can only cause you to say Jesus is Lord. How can you say that and then turn around and say Jesus is accursed? Well, they don't know what they're saying, which is why Paul's saying regarding these things, I don't want you to be ignorant, unaware. And so if we go back to chapter 14, therefore, let the one who um, speaks in a tongue, lalong glosis, pray that he may interpret this word, dermaneu, which or nae, which is to explain, to understand. So therefore, you should pray that you have some sort of interpretation that you can understand what you're saying, why he doesn't want you to be ignorant. Verse 14, for if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. That means you don't understand. The question, though, Corey, is didn't Paul saying that uh, you should pray in tongues? That's not what Paul says. Paul says, he says, for if, iangar prosukamai, that is, if I, and then he uses the subjunctive of pray, may pray, if I may pray, if I happen to pray, or if, and this if is important, if I pray in a tongue. And by the way, um, this is not necessarily to say that or to, or to regard him, he's speaking generally. So if a person happens to pray in a tongue, is Paul saying that he's praying in a tongue? Well, there's a problem with the person who is praying in a tongue. So even if you're saying that if, if, if Paul is saying that if he does so or anyone, the only mentioning of praying in a tongue has a problem attached to it. The problem with praying in a tongue that's attached with it is that there's no understanding because he says, if I pray in a tongue, so Paul's not saying that he does, but if he were to pray in a tongue, what does he say? My spirit prays, I, and, and no one is doubting the people that pray in tongues that their spirit isn't genuine, that they are really trying to make a connection with the Lord. The problem is you don't know what you're saying. Paul says, if you pray that way, if you happen to pray in a tongue, fine. If you're doing so, he says, your mind, our mind, whoever's mind, whoever it is that's doing this, praying in a tongue, he says that your mind, our mind, my mind is unfruitful. It's not a good thing. There's no way around saying that that's a good thing. And we know it's not a good thing. It's a problem because Paul then comes back in verse 15 with a solution. What then is the outcome? What's the solution? I will pray with the spirit, which is fine. And I will also pray with my mind also. And as we keep reading, the whole point is that people can be edified. People can understand that others, including yourself, would know exactly what you're saying. He doesn't want you to be ignorant. So this whole notion of praying in tongues, again, the word lalon or laleo is missing. The word for speaking in tongues is gone. Instead, it's not laleo glosis. It is prosukamai glosis. And so the praying in tongues is something that apparently they were doing, but they were doing something erroneous or there was something erroneous with them praying in tongues. We have no example of someone ever praying in tongues. There's no example in the Bible of anyone in the Bible praying in tongues. There's no example of anyone in the Bible praying and not knowing what it was that they were praying for. They always prayed in the na native language or in an understanding of what they were saying. Oftentimes, maybe it was just unverbalized. But in this case, Paul is saying there's a problem with that. So does the Bible teach that we ought to pray in tongues? No, it does not. And so since we want to be honest to the text, since we want to hold the word of God higher than anything else that we have, because it was literally given to us by the Holy Spirit, let's honor it by doing what Paul says we should not do. And that is to exceed what the text says. Amen. Amen.